Well, welcome to the uh, final session of six. And um, what we want to try and explore this evening, a question, what will we do with uh, the future? Now, what I want to try and do in the first part of the evening is, um, is just speculate. I'm not putting forward blueprints. I don't have those, but speculate and let the speculation be informed by some thinking that's going on in some places as to what the future might be, A, in terms of a United Kingdom and B, in terms of, of, of Ireland. Uh, whatever happens, um, something perhaps change, nothing stands still, but um, we are asking a question about the future. And uh, after focusing a lot on the past, not just a decade of centenaries from 1912 to 1922. But in particular, on this course, we have been trying to look at partition and the impact of partition. Now on the final evening, well, what, what about the, the future? And in the light of partition and Brexit and COVID-19, what is the future? What if is a question. And there may be a lot of what ifs. Brexit has dis exposed, I suppose, the disunited kingdom, not caused it. The whole Brexit approach, I think, failed to recognize the diversity of the United Kingdom, failed or even refused to recognize that the UK is made up of regions which are very diverse in cultures and needs and histories and worldviews. Everything is not English, even that is not mono, but is regionalized and the potential for the breakup of the UK has not gone away. Now, political historian Linda Colley wrote a book which predated Brexit, Brexit and tellingly noted that the political union is in growing difficulty. She also noted that other unions were unraveling or dysfunctional. These included the already unraveled Soviet Union, a dysfunctional America, and she wrote that before Trump, and the European Union she felt at the time of writing had become somewhat unpopular and was also being threatened with uh, cracking up over a lack of policy and certainly the solidarity around COVID, which has been a difficult one. Now, Colley wrote that there are those who have felt for some time that, quote, the explosion of the United Kingdom into various fragments is a foregone conclusion. Colley seems to believe that the future of the United Kingdom may be federal, four national parliaments, and also more devolved power to local and regional governments or authorities. Now, ironically, this was being put forward 100 years ago and more by Lord George, George, Henry Asquith and Walter Long in the years before partition itself. Well, if only there was a lot of discussion about federal approach and federalism leading up to 1920. Federal would include an English parliament and a federal UK would require something which has never existed. And that is a written constitution, which would have it at its heart, a bill of rights. Now a written constitution as Colley sees it would entrench and communicate citizens rights and the working of a devolved political system. She also sees it supplying some what she calls some fresh constitutive stories for a new kind of union. Many of the old sustaining stories and shibboleths, Protestantism, empire, and sagas of the sea are played out. I suppose so too are the repeated World War II allusions, metaphors, and Churchillian sound bites that have frequently played out during the COVID crisis. Now, before COVID, there was a crisis and a constitutional crisis in the offing, which may even be exacerbated by this COVID crisis. And it may be addressed through constitutional reform, producing a federal union, a written constitution and a bill of rights. It may be the only way that the UK is going to survive. The choice in history may be federal or break up and either, if it happens, will impact the future of, of Ireland. Now there is a what if question on the island of Ireland. With Brexit, COVID-19 and the sea change in geopolitics, a small island like Ireland will not be cocooned. 
will partition survive? What will Northern Ireland's future be? The border question never goes away and the constitutional issue may be the great perennial block to a common good and community flourishing. Now, what will Northern Ireland do if the union breaks up? Will Northern Ireland move into a federal union or if the UK implodes, where does Northern Ireland's future lie? Would the people of Northern Ireland want to be part of, say, a narrow English nationalism? Some might, but perhaps there has been enough sea change in Northern Ireland to suggest that many will reject that. The language of the reunification of Ireland is not perhaps a framework for the future either. <clears throat> like United Kingdom, United Ireland may be obsolete also. We are not in 1916 nor 1920, and the worlds of then do not fit the changing world of now. And language and therefore thought forms need to change. Language has already begun to shift, and there is a bit more talk now of an agreed or new Ireland, though I suppose it has hardly moved much beyond talk. If all the people of the island, unionists, nationalists, republicans, neithers, and the various minorities are to embrace a future together, it may well require a radically new Ireland agreed by all. And that may be an Ireland as yet unframed or visioned or imagined by us. Well, the future here too may well have to be federal with parliaments in Dublin and Belfast. Some might prefer a federation based on four provinces, but others may find that too impractical. A federal future needs serious exploration and discourse. Now, whatever the exact form, a new Ireland for all the people of Ireland will probably need a federal structure. In one sense, this is not new, having already been an embryonic aspiration in the Government of Ireland Act of 1920 and the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. Key to any federal Ireland or New Ireland would be the economic basis. Now, the old rhetoric has never quite got down to economics in any serious or concrete way. Perhaps it's too difficult or would be too costly for the people of Ireland, not least because the partitioned Northern Ireland has never been economically self-sufficient or viable. Within its first decade, it faced bankruptcy and needed bailout and continued heavy subventions. So in a federal Ireland or New Ireland, how would we fund education, health care, pensions, roads, infrastructure, transport? What tax structures would be needed? How would we pay for the new federal Ireland? A new or federal Ireland may well need a new constitution. Now, those living in the Republic may feel that the 1937 Constitution, with all its amendments, has served the people well. But a new Ireland will necessitate newness. A new Constitution would probably need to be secular. The preamble from the 1937 Constitution probably made it the most religious Constitution on the planet, complete with a version of Trinitarian theology and a Christology that looked very much in the image of Pierce at the GPO in 1916. It belonged to an era when church and state were inseparable, Ireland's confessional mode. Today, North and South, there is a clear separation of church and state, necessary in a secular pluralistic democracy. Now, secular does not mean the end of religion or that religion has no role in public life. It means the separation of church and state. And a constitution for a new federal Ireland may well need to be secular. And historically, given the sectarian nature of much religion in Ireland, a secular constitution could be positive and even reconciling. At the heart of any new constitution, there might well need to be, again, a Bill of Rights protecting the freedoms of all the people in a new Ireland and spelling out the rights of the citizen. 
a Bill of Rights is a prerequisite for a pluralistic democracy, peace building, freedom. And these do not really exist without legislated rights. And there are no rights without responsibilities. A new Ireland would need, well, let's see what we feel about it. A new anthem? A new flag? Such symbols would be contentious, but there's no avoiding the issues. We either want to shape a new Ireland or hold on to the symbols of the old, in which case there will probably be no new Ireland. But if we want a new and reconciled Ireland, then flags and anthems may well have to change. Now at present, there are two anthems in use on the island. Both are militaristic. Will militarism be part of a new Ireland? Saving the Queen is not an evangelical Protestant prayer for salvation by grace alone. It's about military victory. Send her victorious over all enemies and foes. Now, the soldier's song is a stirring tune, but in the words of the last line, are we forever soldiers chanting a soldier's song? And given the noble peacekeeping role of the current Irish army with the United Nations over many years, is there not dissonance between that role and the aggressive militarism of the anthem? A new Ireland would perhaps have a peace vocation in the world, a sign and historical agent of peace. A new Ireland would provide the historical opportunity to demilitarize our northern and southern mindsets and embrace a culture of peace. And like the very stirring Welsh anthem, any new Ireland anthem could be a celebration of landscape and nature and or an anthem of peace. There are those who might argue that both flags flown in the respective states are already symbols of reconciliation. The Union flag is made up of three crosses, one of which is the cross of St. Patrick. Poor old St. David of Wales got left out somewhere. The green and orange of the Irish flag has the white of peace between the two traditions. Now, all this may be true, but newness perhaps will require a new reconciling symbol. Perhaps the children of Ireland from Derry to Kerry, who have the biggest stake in the future, could have a competition to design a new flag for their new Ireland. Now, these may be what if, and if only speculations. I'm not putting forward blueprints. But if we're in an era, or are entering an era of unprecedented change, it would be foolish to hibernate or bury our heads in the sand, deny history and deny incalculable change. Instead of being overwhelmed and overtaken by change, we need to embrace it and shape it. There is no inevitability about collapse or newness, but there is always a lure to the future, which is ours to shape for the better and the common good. Now, what values would be, or what values might we want to see at the heart of anything new in the future of these two islands? At this point, we'll go into rooms or groups, and there is a question to throw around as well as reflect on that bit of speculation, but the question will be, how will, we, how will we live with the future? How will we live with the future? And we'll take, we'll take 15 minutes uh, with, with that, that question. Okay, we, uh, we resume again. And um, in the second half, I want to say something about, or try to say something about remembering the future. And then we, we open up finally into a plenary uh, discussion um, and conversation as we move towards the end of the evening and the end of the um, six week program. Margaret O'Callaghan is a, a lecturer from Queen's University in history, historian, 
and she began her lecture recently in President Higgins' series, her lecture which was exploring the summer of 1921. She began with a pertinent observation. People living 100 years ago did not know what would come after. We do. I suppose we do look at events of then through the rear view mirror, and we know that they could, we know what they could never have known. It reminds us that we cannot read their time through the lens of our time and make critical judgment from our 21st century perspective. It may also be true that living as we do now, we cannot know what will come after. We all move towards an unknown future and hope that a century from now, people will not judge us harshly or from the perspective of 2121. What we cannot see, we cannot know, yet is there not some obligation, even a moral obligation, to think about consequences that may follow our actions? Did anyone think what the consequences of the revolutionary violence would be? What the consequences of forming illegal armies and gun running would be? Did the British government think through what the consequences of imposing partition on the island of Ireland would be? Perhaps few have the capacity to think hard about consequences. The 55 elderly men in suits who took the world to war in 1914 certainly did not think through consequences and did not know what would come after in another global war, a cold war and genocides and all the current legacies of the empires which they led. So in remembering the future, I want to try and look at certain signposts. And the first is the future of reconciliation. The Good Friday Agreement provided us in Ireland with a framework for peace and reconcili a reconciliation process. It may still be the best framework we have. And if it were to collapse through the refusal of militant elements, say, to work it, we might then descend into social and political chaos for a generation. And at the end of that, we would arrive back, I suspect, where we started and go again with the Good Friday Agreement or an identikit dressed up in other language, fooling us into thinking that we're onto something new. It might well be classic Good Friday Agreement for slow learners. Now at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement, there are three strands of relationships, the totality of relationships without which there will be no peace or reconciliation. These are the relationships within Northern Ireland, more complex now than they were even a decade ago. There are the relationships between North and South and those between East and West Irish British. The three strands are not going away. They're not likely to change whatever political structures may change in the future and will have to be lived through if we're to have any meaningful future, a relational future, even a reconciled future. Reconciliation is about relationships and is therefore social reconciliation. And relationships need structures and reconciled relationships certainly need structures, which is why the Good Friday Agreement provided for political structures. But there's more to social reconciliation than political structures, important as they are. There are at least six integrated strands which we describe with the prefix socio to indicate the reconciliation is not an individualistic thing. And the six integrated strands of social reconciliation are socio-political, socio-economic, socio-legal, socio-environmental, socio-psychological, having to do with identities and identity politics, belonging, and socio-spiritual, having to do with purpose and meaning and values. The so reconciliation is a key priority for the future, taking in the totality of relationships and requiring all six integrated strands of reconciliation is to be a meaningful process. There is no remembering the future without social reconciliation and reconciliation also requires the practice of democracy and an embedded culture of human rights. 
The second signpost is the future of the Atlantic West. In a context of disappearing landmarks and global geopolitical shifts, and a future where nothing is guaranteed or inevitable, the people of these islands need to do hard thinking and creative imagination. The United Kingdom may not last, at least in its present form, and nothing in history does last forever. A united Ireland is not inevitable, and again in history nothing ever is. We do need to learn from history. The next two decades may well see constitutional crises. The Union has been in crisis at least once every hundred years over the last 500 years. Perhaps it is due another crisis. The repetitive mantra demanding a border pole is, at times it seems opportunist, shallow, lacking realism, and is a repeated denial that it will, as is the repeated denial that a border pole will never happen. It will happen. The Good Friday Agreement provides for it, as it is clear also on the principle of consent. And the realism is that before it does, a lot of hard thinking needs to be done, careful preparation made, and the disastrous mistake of a Brexit poll avoided. No yes, no in out poll, but probably a different poll for each part of Ireland, with a range of considered options on the paper, and possibly more than one poll being needed. Brexit divided people, has threatened the union, and will be contentious for a generation and more. A border poll has to be different, with a lot of reconciliation work needed before perhaps even a poll is declared. Partition did not settle Ireland, and a Brexit-type simplistic poll will not settle Ireland either, whatever way it turned out. The British inability or capacity to opt for the much talked about federalism a century ago may have to be visited again if a union is to have a future. A federal union may be a way forward, but increasingly it seems nationalist England may resist that again, as will a conservative party. But there may be no future union without federalism. And it may be the way for a new Ireland, which will need to be completely new. The future may be unknown, but we do make it, and imagining the future is a present imperative. The third signpost is the future with civic conversations. The Shared Island Initiative of Antishok was incredibly careful to decouple the dialogue initiative from the constitutional question. It is not, as some out of their deep fear have said, a backdoor to United Ireland. It is rather a creative opportunity to dialogue on what good neighbourliness is and what together can lead to prosperity and flourishing on the island of Ireland. How do we create together a space where all can share greater equality and well-being by improving the health, education, economic and environmental good of all? We need to talk. It is a human thing to do. Understand one another our diverse longings, hopes and fears and needs. Can we share this island peacefully and in the sharing of a common good? Well, the need is for civic conversations. The future cannot be left to politicians alone. Politicians are necessary and politics can be a noble expression of public service. Democracy is pluralist, participative and deliberative and involves political and civic society. The shared island dialogues to date are much more centralized, but civic conversations need to happen regionally on an all Ireland basis. And local groups can take initiatives, whether based in Donegal and Down, Derry and Mayo, Belfast and Dublin, Larn and Dundalk. Well, civic conversations also need to take place between Irish groups and partners in each of the constituent UK regions of Scotland, Wales and England. And the medium of Zoom means anything is possible. Active civic conversations on the key issues are essential to building the future. 
the fourth signpost, the future and the common good. The common good is an inclusive vision of flourishing and well-being, which is both human and ecological. There is no future without eco and human flourishing. The major crisis is that facing the planet and cannot be solved by any one nation, but by all acting together. Climate justice requires global action, which is why the Glasgow meeting of world leaders in November 2021 is so important and crucial. And people from the poorer region, regions are insisting on an in-person gathering and not virtual because they do not have the technology or the adequate connectivity to fully participate. But they want their voices to be heard in Glasgow because they suffer most from climate warming and the crisis. The common good is the common good of the whole community of life and socioeconomic and eco-justice are at the heart of a common good. We need to be engaged in in-depth exploration of the common good, what it means as vision and praxis. <coughs> Civic conversations are again important and significant as the 2021 Irish School of Ecumenics series, I think, has shown, and which continues into the next two years. The last signpost, the global future. <clears throat> a century ago, people on the island of Ireland were engaged in trying to build a different future for Ireland. We know that there were at least two competing visions, perhaps better described as contested visions, which led to the partition of Ireland. We live with the legacies of partition and the contestedness of history and contested social and co political commitments are still present. We might need to acknowledge that there are still contested futures without easy resolution. Some will settle for nothing less than an ideological future shaped by a narrow ideological interpretation of 1916. Others dogmatically assert that only the union matters and nothing else. The union matters more than prosperity, more than any common good, more than reconciliation. While both mindsets may lack imagination and may lack social capacity and social vision, we are not going to live in 1916 or 1921 as though history can be frozen or life suspended because the world will not allow us. 100 years ago, they may not have known what would come after, but they thought they were building their different futures for their different parts of Ireland, and I suppose they were. But a century later, it is not just Ireland. We are global now in a way that they were not then. The future we build now is a global future. That is the reality we now live in, a smaller, interdependent, interrelated world where everyone is my neighbor and the future of the planet is inseparable from any human future. We are global citizens, globally responsible citizens, one incredibly diverse community of life bound together in a living unity. The future is eco-human, or perhaps there is no future. Of course we can be Irish or British or both, or Chinese, Indian, Ethiopian, Bolivian, or whatever. But we are more than that. And the global future means that identity politics will enlarge and expand. Identities always change and we keep reinventing them. Now we need to reinvent again, only this time, imagining identities in global perspective. We may need to be earthlings first, humans second, and then a whole multiplicity of layers of identity, some of which we already have, but maybe fail to recognize or, or deny. The global future means that we will live with complex identities and even maybe come to celebrate the creative complexities. 
We have, I think, learned a lot during the decade of centenaries. And our horizons have been expanded. And our histories have been enlarged and we have begun, I think, the important work of what we might call narrative repair. We may be in a better place now to remember the future and build it. But there is a question. What will they say about us in 2121? 